Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV. Uh, the main talking points on tonight's programme. Cathro hanging by a thread at Hearts. Dundee all set for another derby in the League Cup draw. Michael O'Halloran happy to be back at St Johnston. Yeah, just a few of the talking points on tonight's programme. The week before, the big kick-off across all four divisions in Scotland. Of course, League Cup well and truly underway and now into the last 16. That's uh, one of our main talking points tonight. And of course, uh, one of the results that was screaming out at us, Ruffy, was uh, Hearts 2-2 against Infermline. They lose out <coughs> on penalties. They're out of the League Cup and there's a bit of pressure on the manager. Yeah, there certainly is. Uh, there's been pressure mounting, I think, since uh, December. The results haven't been going his way. Uh, an earlier bad result in this group and then another one at the weekend. And uh, he will be under pressure. But as most uh, the managers and the players will tell you, the only way to dig yourself out pressure is winning games. Uh, I don't think he's near the sacking offence yet, but it's not an ideal situation going into a massive big game at the start of the season when the fans aren't 100% behind you. So he needs a win. Yeah, here's a look at the uh, back page headlines, which uh, again, as you can see, uh, dominated by that defeat and the uh, League Cup knockout. And Gary Mackay, a former uh, Hearts player and of course legend at Tynecastle, says our fans are being cheated. It was the wrong appointment. And uh, there's uh, Neil McCann getting a, a derby wish from the draw, which we'll talk about a little later on. And uh, the Daily Record is all about uh, Pedro Cachinha saying he's got a team of men now. Uh, there's also the focus on the uh, Dundee Derby, which was a fantastic game at the weekend. Here's the Daily Mail. Uh, and a story there about Sean Maloney potentially coming to Celtic Park uh, as a coach. He was linked with a move to Aberdeen. And then it says, Hearts running out of time to save Cathro. And the Courier... Uh, with the focus there on the rerun of the Dundee Derby. It was uh, uh, full to the gunnels at Dens Park and <coughs> yet again we'll get another helping of that. It was a thoroughly enjoyable game but let's stick with um, Ian Cathro because Gordon Smith, I don't think it's anything to do with how he coaches as far as the laptop which was labelled Adam earlier. It's, it's getting the response out of the players and, and as Ruffy says, Results are the only thing that matters, but I suppose you need Celtic like a hole in the head for yeah. your first game of the season. Absolutely, and uh, I think Celtic are a really tough starting game, but the, the, I think the first four games are away from home because of the stadium being uh, you know, refurbished in the new stand, and then they get the, the, the first home game's Aberdeen, which will be a tough one as well. So it is a hard time for him. As Ruffy says, it is, it is very crucial for any manager. It's a results business, without doubt it is. And he's already on a negative spiral because what's happened at the moment is because of the hearts going out at this level in the League Cup uh, in, in a group which they basically should have been winning. You know, that's why the, the fans are all turning on. But I don't think he's done very well with his, his interviews as well and what he's saying. You know, he's no apology to the supporters. It's almost like as if to say, I don't need to talk to them. Uh, I'm not interested in that. What, you know, they won't be interested in what I've got to say or whatever. They will be. They want to hear something as, as to why things aren't going well. He's made a lot of recruitment, you know, and, and everyone, even ex-players, Gary Mackay was one of them. I think Alan Preston also had a, a real go at him and said he's got to go. People aren't giving him rough. He says he's got to get given more of a chance, but there's already people are saying the time is now that he should be out. Yeah, um, well, uh, what about the Hearts fans? Earlier today, I caught up with Hearts fan Nicholas Walker and started off by asking him if uh, Saturday's game was really as bad as everyone was making out. Well, to be honest, Peter, I don't, I don't think so. Not with the sort of hype that the, the management have been giving them over the, la over the summer. Um, I would expect to see a lot more heart, for want of a better word, in the performances. And it just seems that they run out of ideas very quickly and management don't seem to know how to change things when we need to. Do you sense that the fans are turning on them? 100%. I think the, the fans have been very, very patient. And in today's you know footballing world, it, fans can turn very quickly. But I think Hearts fans have been patient for a good number of months now and we've yet to see any of these promises that he's been making. Yeah, What do you make of the team overall because Ann Budge has backed him financially? Well I think we've made some good signings um, you know I think Lafferty is scoring which is great it's nice to have a striker up top that's managing to put the small number of chances that we're creating into the net but I'm not sure that 
those are Cathro's signings. I'd be I'd be guessing that that could be something to do with maybe McPhee having the sort of Northern Ireland influence, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's down to the director of football. I don't really know how much influence Cathro has in those signings. Uh, uh, how much of a distraction has the Jamie Walker saga had on the the team and the fans? I think that's I think that's been a great problem because. Supporters, you want to see your best player playing, you know, regardless if he's if he wants away, you know, that game, whether you like it or not, that League Cup is something that we would have liked to have had a good run and and he's one of our strongest players. You want to see him playing. Yeah, and over and above that, I, I, I'm now looking at um, a lot of people voicing their concerns, not only about the manager, but of course, uh, maybe looking for a statement from Craig Levine. Is that something you think is necessary? Absolutely, and I think it's something that we should have heard a long time ago, really, even towards maybe the the end of the season when results were were really poor. It did seem like um, everyone at the club had kind of written off that season when we still had four or five games to go. And as a supporter, you're just turning up, you're putting your money in. That's frustrating to see. OK, here's a $64,000 question. Ian Cathro, should he stay or should he go? I think he has to go. If he has to go, Nicholas, who would you like to see become the next Hearts manager? Well, I think that's a tricky one because if Levine stays, as there are many guys out there that want to work with him, I think that would be interesting. I mean, personally, as a fan, I would like to see Paul Hartley. That would be my choice. OK. Uh, what do you make of that, Ruffy? Yeah, I think he said a lot, a lot of sense, you know, that uh, the results haven't been there, as I said, and the, the supporters are the ones who are saying it week in, week out. Uh, it just amends how many supporters we're talking about, because we all know that a group of supporters can make a lot of noise, mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes board members then uh, start to, to worry and, and think about doing things drastically. But I, I just think he, he's put himself in a bit of a noose. You see Celtic obviously coming up. He, he's not far away from a really, really bad result that board members will have to make decisions. And I'm talking about hammering off somebody. And, and, and as Gordon said, it's not an ideal situation to play your first four games away from home, which is going to be difficult to pick up points. So the momentum will grow, but the only the only way we'll stop it is, is getting a possible result at Parkhead and, and then picking up points away from home. Because you look, yeah. you look at Rangers, yeah. who get knocked out of Europe, end of the world, as far as everybody's concerned, and now they've strung two results together and the manager's saying, I've got my team now. Well, three you know, to a degree, but they get the draw with Marseille yeah, as well. So the supporters will buy in. But, but the results do matter. But the thing about it is the interesting factor will be whether Craig Levine has been manager there before and whether it'd be a case of saying, if he does go, Craig Levine come, takes over as a caretaker for a little while and see if that turns around. If, it, if that turns it around, there might be yeah. you know, a, a structure there where they say, you know, and Budge might even be saying it, you stay in charge here. I don't think I don't think I, I don't think the Hearts fans would buy into Craig Levine. It would if you get the results, Peter. Do you know what I mean? No, but you'd have to you'd actually you'd actually have to convince them to make the appointment in the first place. Well, I, I don't think there's a, a groundswell of opinion that's well, calling for that. They would though, but it's easy. I mean that, that was a good <coughs> suggestion he had was Paul Hartley is available, yeah. obviously. But the thing about it is that Craig Levine could get away with it on the basis of uh, you know, the manager's out, but I'm going to be taking over as caretaker and he says I was not involved in any decisions he was making regarding players and his and his tactics and all that sort of thing. I'm, I'm a new manager coming in here basically but I'm going to do it on a caretaker basis yeah. then you might get away with taking it for a little while and then see how it works out and if it works out well then the fans might turn around and say stay in charge you know? yeah. um, Ruffy Celtic Kilmarnock Rangers Motherwell next on the horizon the first home game is at home to Aberdeen, Aberdeen. <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough one, a really tough one. That's why the manager and the players have got to get their act together. There's not to say they will do well in these games, but the situation as it stands just now, the supporters are just waiting on a bad result. You know, everybody, everybody's not with them 100%, mm -hmm. and that's a, a horrible thing going in at the beginning of the season. I've always said you want to go into your first game of the season, firstly on a winning run, and everybody pushing in the right direction. That's not the situation at Hearts. It was such a crucial game on Saturday. What uh, surprised me was Jamie Walker still didn't get in the team yeah. and say to him, like, you know, you have to show these fans that you know, you're, you're not you've got a bad attitude. You want to play. Because he's their key player. And there's no doubt about it. Last season, he was the main player, highest goal scorer for them. 
they require them a lot. So why leave them out even the squad in, in total? I yeah. can't understand that, Peter. Mm, some big decisions to be made and uh, no doubt the board will continue monitoring this on a game-by-game -game basis. If the fans stop coming, uh, you know the manager's, uh, well, the clock's ticking quicker than he would like. Um, we'll keep an eye on the Hearts situation uh, coming up after the break. We'll look at that League Cup draw. We'll discuss that uh, cracking Dundee derby from the weekend. There's another one uh, to look forward to as well. So, uh, join us after the break. We've got one of those classic questions to take us into the break Who am I? I wonder if you can put a name to this first clue Tough one in the quiz as you come back to the studio here, Ruffy. You've already gone for the answer early on with mm -hmm. supreme confidence as well. It's not like you to give me an answer after clue number one. Yeah, and, and if you're asking me, say who it is, it means I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you could be right. You yeah, never well, I know. Say that. Yeah, well, I that's won't exactly. say hang on then, Ruffy. You might just take all the honours at the end of it. Uh, welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. Gordon Smith is with me, Peter Martin, and of course, Alan Ruff, as ever, uh, with us on the show. Um, let's have a look at the other results from the League Cup fixtures before we look at that last 16 draw. Here's how it all panned out over the weekend. Good result for Falkirk away at Brecon Inverness with a 2-1 win over Forfar. Uh, and as you can see, the aforementioned Hearts draw with Dunfermline. Dunfermline winning on penalties. In Group C, it was <coughs> Wraith Rovers with a triumph and uh, Dundee won Dundee United 1. We're going to talk about that next, but United win it on penalties 4-3. And Hibbs with another confidence-boosting win away at Alawa. Ross County winning the penalty shootout. Uh, an emphatic victory for Air United at Annan and Kilmarnock. Good start to the season for Kelly. 3-0 with that win over Dumbarton. Morton 5-0 over Edinburgh City. Motherwell just edging Berwick Rangers out. And Hamilton again with a good positive win over Stenhouse Muir. Queen of the South with the win on penalties against Albion Rovers. And there, as you can see, Panic Thistle uh, defeating Stranraer and St Mirren this time after being thumped 5-0 in the last <coughs> game, win by five goals to nil against the Adrianians. So here's the draw for the last 16. St Johnston will take on Partick Thistle. It's Hibs against Air United, Rangers Dunfermline, Ross County Motherwell, Falkirk against Livingston, Hamilton Aberdeen, Celtic Kilmarnock and Dundee against Dundee United. So that's the draw. I don't know if you guys were able to watch it. I thoroughly enjoyed the Dundee derby. I thought it was a fantastic game, Ruffy. Yeah, well, Ray McKinnon said uh, at the end of the day, uh, this was the one he wanted to win. This was the one that he wanted to get the Dundee United supporters right on board for the start of the season. He got that win. Obviously, it was penalties, but he'll take that. Uh, and again, another fantastic game in the, in the next round. Uh, great to see the two Dundee teams, you know, turn up in full force and it just shows you how much we've missed them. I thought yeah. it was a good crowd as well, Peter. The, you know, get great support. We, we, we reckon we weren't going to get a Dundee derby and all of a sudden that's us going to have two in the space of a few weeks. But I thought Dundee United did well because to be honest with you, before the game, I had my worries about them because they were short of uh, strikers. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they had to play without even an out-and-out -out striker. McDonald was on the bench. He's not fully fit yet. Got his chance when he came on. But the young boy, Matty Smith, wasn't available. James Keatings wasn't available either through injury, and then, as I say, Scott McDonald. So once Dundee United get their strikers uh, in there, then, you know, I think that could be a right good semi, a uh, right good cup tie when they play again. Although it's at Dens Park, it wouldn't make a big difference to it because the atmosphere was excellent. Yeah, I thought it was a great atmosphere. I mean, I, I take on board what you said, maybe United missing a couple of players, but I thought in the second half, uh, Dundee may well have been the team that might have just edged it for me. I thought they played some really good football. Scott Allen, I've always been a huge fan of him, Ruffy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think he's a creative player. When he gets time and space, he can really hurt you, as he proved on the on the day. But I, I, I really thought they were, I thought Dundee mm -hmm. were impressive. And and again, you know, in Sophie and Musa, they look as if they've got somebody who can cause trouble up front. Yeah, but I think the main man's going to be, as you said, there, Scott Allen. We saw Scott Allen at Hibs, and, and every time I saw him, he sort of dominated the game. He was the one that was pulling the strings. 
Uh, and I think he'll do likewise. I think if uh, Neil McCann can find a position for him, as you just said there, gives him a bit of space, gives him a bit of time, I think he could cause a lot of problems. He, he, there's not many players can see a pass the way he sees it, but obviously he needs runners around about him yeah. to see that pass. He's got to do it now. He, he really, his career has, has you know, not been going the way he would have wanted it to go. He's had good moves, obviously went down south, didn't quite work out. His best spell so far was at Hibs, without doubt. So this is a great opportunity for him now being at Dundee. He's got good players, as you said, he's got Musa there and, and people around about him. And I think he's the key player there because he's the most creative. He's the one that, that can create the chances and score goals as well. He's got a good shot on him too. Yeah, um, Musa is one of those guys that I think Neil McCann is predicting to become a cult hero. Um, and, uh, and the substitute, uh, Walters, he, yeah. he impressed me, he can whip in a fantastic cross with his left yeah. peg, Ruffy. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you bring these kind of players to the club. It's always good at this part of the season when, you know, the fans can see new players, players they don't know and they get excited by when they've got a wee trick or two. And uh, I think that's just w what makes the beginning of the season so exciting. Yep, um, other clubs will still be strengthening. I think uh, one player that caught my eye at the weekend just back playing football, happy to be back playing football, is of course Michael O'Halloran. Um, come on as a substitute in that game he, I mean he just never he never got a chance I think at Rangers on a regular basis, some people would say when he had his chance he didn't actually Did set it? the heather on fire, you know what the pressure's all yeah. uh, playing for Rangers you have to sometimes hit the ground running Absolutely, you have to get it right away but I, I also thought, to be honest with you, Peter, I always have my worries about him at Rangers because of one aspect, for me he was a counter-attack player and, and Rangers weren't playing that sort of style. Rangers were mainly, mainly in possession of the ball. Teams were sitting in against them. And I don't think he's as comfortable. The way St Johnson play, <coughs> he's ideal for them. I think he's a very good signing for St Johnson. I think that they'll be delighted with that because he can revive his career again and play in the style of football that St Johnson are used to playing. and he yeah. knows how they play. I think the biggest in. problem with that line, though, uh, Gordon, is quite simply Mark Walters. Uh, Mark Walters. Mark Warburton knew what he was getting. I mean, he, he knew what type of player he was before he bought him. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's why I was quite surprised at it. In terms of the style of play, he was buying a good player because he'd, he'd been outstanding against Rangers. I was at the game, a cup tie, and, and I thought he was absolutely tremendous. Rangers couldn't handle him. But the thing was, it was a different style of play that Rangers were going to play and that's why I wondered about the signing because I thought I'm not quite sure he's going to fit in I wondered whether he was going to change his style because he got a Haller in there but he didn't Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, of the other um, teams involved in the draw, we're happy with a Dundee derby again. I'm sure the whole city is buzzing at the uh, thought of that. In uh, comes Celtic and they get a home tie against Kilmarnock, uh, Ruffy. And Rangers have a home <coughs> game against Infermont. Yeah, I think Celtic, uh, obviously, I think they'll look at coming off the back of the European tie. We don't know what's going to happen there. We saw always a, a wee reaction when you come off the kind of uh, European game you get. Players start, the team starts rotating. So that's what Kilmarnock will be looking at. They'll be looking at what kind of team Celtic are going to put out, obviously depending on the result. But uh, I think Lee McCullough uh, has went in there and used his contacts and got players into the club. A lot of players, were, he's went for a lot of experience, whereas Kilmarnock two or three years ago had all the youngsters coming through. Mm -hmm. But I think now, you know, he said to himself, look, this is what I need to establish myself in this league. Well, two of the goal scorers at the weekend were Burke and Irwin, who have been brought in. You know what I mean? So, and and, and I think that uh, you know that's what he's trying to do. Strength. My understanding was that Kilmarnock were poor in the first half, but played really well second half. That was the same as the game I actually went to see. They played Clyde, and they were down two one at half time. But the second half performance was totally different. So maybe they've got to do it over the piece. But see what you're saying earlier on about the draw, Peter. You said about home draws. I thought it was quite interesting because I actually assumed when the draw was going to be made that all the seeded teams were going to get first out of the hat and I thought they would all be at home. But it was quite interesting what they did was they made it alternate. Yeah. So the first the first draw out, the seeded team was first out, then the next draw was the seeded team was second. So I thought that was quite clever to do it like that and I thought it was a good draw. Yeah, um, you had lost me and Ruffy after yeah. the first. I, I, I was looking at it thinking, what are you doing? What are you doing with these, with these balls? But at yeah. the end of the day, um, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you can get some good ties. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about Rangers and Celtic and their friendlies at the weekend as well. But they're out of the draw. One of the other um, ties that I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, Ruffy, was of course Hibs. They've been impressive in this League mm -hmm. Cup, uh, and of course we've been talking about the Lithuanians. There's the increased speculation that he's getting ever closer to a deal with Anthony Stokes, and of course. Of 
if um, Chris Commons' back uh, stands up to mm. uh, any kind of training, you never know. You might be able to attract him as well. Yeah, and, and I think Neil Lennon's the same as Lee McCulloch. He's identifying players that he's played with. He, he knows the players he's with. That uh, He knows what he can get out of them. He knows that they'll have the experience to go in and handle the, the Premiership games. So actively, again, I think he's getting a, a really experienced side. All oh, right, there's still some two or three young boys running about, but certainly he's looking for that kind of experience. Yeah, this is us getting to the business end of it. There are three, I mean, I mean when Pedro Cachina says he's now got a team of men, uh, you've got Hibs there starting to put what I think is a, a formidable side together as well. They've got a bit of physical presence, uh, they've got height in the team, and they've got, of course, uh, a, a retained a lot of the players who won the championship last season. They've added the likes of Murray. So. Yeah. They've got quality as well. I think this is what's intriguing about not only a League Cup, but the start of the season coming. Yeah, in terms of where Hibs are going to be, I agree with you. I think that uh, you know Neil Lenz made some good signings, no doubt about that. He'd be building the team, he got the team playing, he'll be going up there. He's not saying too much, but I think Neil will, will be considering you know definitely moving. A top six spot, I believe, will be a certainty for Hibs. I mean, and it just depends how they put this team together, whether they can challenge for maybe sec a third, a fourth place, you know, the, the higher bit of the, of the top section. But I think that it'll be good. But th that'll be a good tie way, yeah. Because all credit to Air United. There's a team that were relegated out of the Championship last year. A terrible run at the very end of the season. And yet they won their four games in the League Cup already. And, you know, b including beating Coman up. So you've got to give them credit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, join us uh, after the break. We'll look at uh, some of the friendly matches that were played over the weekend. We'll be looking ahead to uh, the Champions League match for Celtic in Trondheim against Rosenberg. Here's uh, clue number two in our quiz. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. Monday evening, our boot room guest it has to be Gordon Smith alongside Alan Ruff and myself, Peter Martin. After clue two, Ruffy, you've changed your mind again, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Uh, because obviously the second bit doesn't fit my yeah. player. So Totty's out for you now. Totty's out. Totty's out, OK. <laughs> yeah. I feel a song coming Totties out. out um, uh, let's <laughs> look at uh, some of the friendlies that were played over the weekend. <clears throat> Rangers, another confidence-boosting win. Pedro Cachinha said in the press this morning he feels he's, as if he's got a, a team of men. He's, he's building his own side. There are a number of issues with players that I'll get your thoughts on, but still a 2-0 win over Sheffield Wednesday and a huge range of support down there. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good, good result. There's no doubt about that because although you have to say that uh, the teams have played Watford and obviously uh, Sheffield Wednesday are behind in terms of their preparation of where Rangers are at the moment. They're, they're slightly longer before they have to play. It's, it's a week on Saturday. But nevertheless, there's still good quality teams. A lot of people were expecting both of them to, to beat Rangers because Rangers are away from home both games. So you have to say that he, he's turning things around. He's getting his players in. That was always a key aspect we talked about as to whether that once he gets his players in, the, the key players, especially, you know, like Alves and Dorans and, and, and Jack playing alongside him in the team, that kind of core through the team, that would strengthen Rangers. And it seems to be working at the moment. So their, their preparation is, is, is quite strong. A terrible result in, in Europe, but since then they've had the draw with Marseille and then the two wins, so they'll be quite confident. But I mean, he shouldn't come out yet and say too much in terms of where they are. It was like, I've got men in the team, that's a criticism of those who were playing before. And uh, you know, when he came in in the job, remember, he said at first that he had the best uh, squad in the country. So all of a sudden, he's now he's hinting the fact that they weren't the best squad in the country. Yeah. I think he was reading a bit of PR, to be honest with you. Let's, <laughs> Possibly. Let's, uh, let's cut to the chase on that yeah. one. Um, but as far as, you know, as a coach, Pedro Cachina, now maybe has to do what um, Brendan Rodgers uh, achieved at Celtic with some players that maybe we'd all written off. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about Josh Windass. Yeah. You know, it looks as if he's putting himself forward and saying, you know, uh, I can really work under you. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm not those players uh, like the rest of Mark Warburton's yeah. signings that's heading out the door. Well, that's what I mean. If any player, if you get the right system, Peter, players will fit in better. Maybe Josh Windass is going to fit in better now with the players he's got around about him. It's interesting information. He is going for a 4-4-2, which means he's going to play two strikers. Uh, now, the interesting thing will be how he plays his midfield, because if he plays his midfield and two of them are wider players, then you'll always have the two central players against 
most teams who play three in there. That's the, that's the big issue in football these days of how you set up because if you if you only get four midfield players against five, you sometimes have difficulty getting the ball <coughs> to your front two. But it's certainly worked so far in the three games he's got. And the big test will come when they start playing the, the league matches, the competitive matches against teams who are ready. Mother will have a decent start in the League Cup, to be fair, but you would say that in terms of player-wise now, Rangers have a stronger squad and they should be going there to play at Mother with a bit of confidence. Yeah, and the key to it, I think, uh, Ruffy, you know, we're talking about the pressures of uh, Ian Cathro. The Luxembourg uh, loss uh, against Progress Niederkorn is gone. Now the focus is, you know, mm -hmm. two, three wins. The last thing any Rangers fan, I think, will tolerate is, you know, early season, any kind of gap opening. Just mm -hmm. let's make it interesting, I think, will be uh, the, the cry from most of the, the, the Rangers fans. Yeah, I think after the, the, the European uh, disappointment, the, the people who will have to sort that out will be the financial people who have obviously budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have to worry about that now the people that uh, deal with that side of it are the ones who have to sort that out. He's got to concentrate on the team. And, and I've said all along that uh, I do believe that pre-season going in to the first game with wins under your belt helps you. you know. But when you get the wins, yeah, you should shout about it. Because if you don't get the points or the wins, people just say, oh, we're just using it as a training exercise. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. you know. But when you're winning the games, take it while it's there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, just uh, a little rumour that I always like to deal in gossip, Gordon. Uh, Sunderland could have been, uh, might be looking at Martin Waghorn to return uh, to the club. I still think Waghorn's got a job to do for Rangers. I like him coming on to his left foot. Yeah, it's just, it depends whether how Rangers played him because in, in the time he was there under uh, you know the previous management, obviously, they had him play and Warburton played him as a wide player coming in. Didn't play him that often as a central striker, but now you've got two strikers. That's why I wondered actually whether even Garner might have been actually better uh, if there'd be two strikers. He's steady, already, steady, Gordon. Know, steady now, let's not... Moved on. I but looked was, at you as if you were sensible there and then you kind of lost the plot for me. Well, he's, to be fair, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he didn't look suited at all. He plays a no. single striker and some players don't and yet he's gone down south again and he's, he's getting goals because he's playing two up front. So is that, what I'm saying, Wycorn is a decency, but I don't know whether he would want to be staying on there if he's actually not going to get a regular game. If he's not going to be a starter, yeah. he may not want to be there. Yep. <clears> um, <throat> OK, uh, that's uh, Rangers in their win over Sheffield Wednesday at the weekend. Uh, Celtic were also on their travels, uh, a much-changed Celtic side, but still with an emphatic win over Sunderland, um, roughly mm -hmm. five goals to nil. Yeah, I don't think anybody would imagine that that would happen, especially with the team that he put out. It was a very, very young side, uh, obviously players for the future. But again, you know, it just shows you a lot of people knock our football up here and there. We've got we're two teams down there uh, taking on uh, the best in that division and, and winning quite comfortably. So we must be doing something right. Uh, and it's good to see these young players getting a chance. But Celtic will know that game is just shelved now. The big one is Wednesday night, you yeah. know. So although, as, again, you take every result when you get it, but there are bigger, bigger well, he fish had, to he fry. He had to play. He couldn't go with his full squad because this this next game now is a crucial match yeah. this week. I mean, beforehand, it might have been looking at the scenario when, the, when this game was arranged, thinking, well, we'll maybe get a good result at home, a good win. We go over there, we just need to be to be solid and keep our, our shape. But the thing is now, right, Celtic need to go there now and get a result. You yeah. know what I mean? They've got to go over there and, and, and score. play to win. They've one, got to one. score. Absolutely. So it's a different game all of a sudden now. So that's why it was it was interesting to see them playing. But the, it shows you the strength of the squad when they can beat can go down to Sunderland and win 5 and nothing. Yeah, but I, I've quality. got to put it in perspective, though. Sunderland are a poor outfit right now. I mean, they've been dogged over the last, what, 10, 15 years, constantly yeah. sacking managers. It's, it's not a... They're it's not a well-run club. Still where they're playing, though. I know what you're saying, but they're still... They've got players who played in Premier football in England last yeah. season, albeit they didn't do that well, but the, a lot of people would still say the Premier is well ahead of Scottish football. And therefore, although they're now in the championship, they've still got a strong squad. They're one of the contenders for promotion. So that, that's still good that Celtic can go there and win comfortably. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think they're in turmoil. I mean, they're, they're already mm -hmm. taking action against one of their players, Darren Gibson, Ruffy. <clears throat> I won't use his exact wording, but <laughs> basically he's been chatting to some fans and I think he'd had a few after the game and said, you know, the players are not 
how can I put it? The players are rubbish. Mm -hmm. And he said some of the players don't care that play for Sunderland. And he said he does care. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he had a good pedigree at United, dogged by injury. He didn't quite cut it at Everton. But um, clearly he's looked at it and thought some of these players are just not up to it. Yeah, the, the, it's unfortunate. It doesn't matter uh, what football team you're at. Uh, there are certain individuals at certain clubs who like to hear their their own voice, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, it's not going to go down well with the rest of the dressing room because yeah. he's obviously not named named names. So yeah. that means well, I think everybody... he's named a few. Well, uh, no, but I mean, <laughs> I think that's the problem. No, but I mean, he's got to go back into the dressing room, you know. So and that will be the problem for for him. Yeah, but uh, sometimes when these things happen, you've just got to keep it to yourself. Yeah, as far as Celtic are concerned, Gordon, the, the dilemma again is if Griffiths makes it, then fine. Yeah. Uh, you know what percentage of him is fit is open to debate, but I, I I think that's the crucial element of it. They're talking about James Forrest maybe up front. Yeah. McGregor scores a hat trick at the weekend. I, I think McGregor's got the ability to score I, I, you know he's the type of person you would play up there yeah I think so too I, I know he's more comfortable so was my, myself at times I get put up front in games and I wasn't as comfortable in terms of getting on the chances as I, I was coming from a deeper position I think McGregor will be a bit like that but I really rate him I think he's an excellent player and, and, and it's going to be tough for him whether he can actually you know get a regular game for Celtic but I think you know you could play him there or you play somebody else up there that drops off and then the runners come from deeper and it might suit them to come from a little bit deeper but I think Celtic have still got capability although they don't have, maybe Griffiths is not fit and Bailey's not going to be fit they should have still enough potential to score over there Well I think the, the, the footnote to all this Ruffy is there's an air of confidence among the Rosenborg camp that they think they can knock Celtic out this would be a big scalp for them <laughs> bitter blow for Celtic but I think I take on board what Brendan Rodgers said at the end of the first leg of this there will be space for some of his more creative players in this second leg. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. They they they, they have to score as well as Celtic, you know. But uh, they will be saying Celtic might have to come out a wee bit more as well. And what they'll be saying is, look, even at Parkhead, we got three chances. Mm -hmm. You know, Rosenberg. So they, quite rightly, they'll be confident, you know, with the performance because everybody had written them off about they know the Rosenberg it used to be. They, they know the team that used to get into the group stages. So Celtic have got a game in their hands. You know, I think the striker thing's a big, big, a big, big decision that he's got to make. You know, you're talking about Forrest getting up there. There's still no striker on the bench. You know, getting into a competition <laughs> like that and yeah. if things don't go well, you look at the bench to see how it's going to get you at a hole mm. and unfortunately the strikers are injured. OK, um, we will talk about <laughs> safe standing uh, Celtic pioneers in Scotland and the English clubs look as if they're going to follow suit. And we'll also have the answer to the quiz. Yeah, Paolo Maldini, you, you just gone for it too early, Ruffy. You, mm. you know, you've just got to bide your time, wait for clue number two. Yeah, mm. that's right. But uh, when you play these competitions, if you were getting points, you get bigger points if you can get it in first. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to I'm take the chance <laughs> to get bigger points. Yeah. I'll bear that in mind. I'll make it a points <laughs> quiz now yeah. for the entire season. Yeah. But uh, Paolo Maldini he just seemed to be there forever in that Milan side. What a he, player. He was brilliant. I went, I went to see them in, uh, in the early 90s as well, playing and uh, he was absolutely outstanding. He was actually, fair enough, he was a centre-half that started off as a left-back, but he was actually always a centre-back. But they, they, they started him there because of the other players they had, and he was just young, but eventually he moved into being a centre-back, and he was absolutely an outstanding player. If you're, took, if you're looking at a world 11 from all positional sense, you would yeah. put Maldini would be in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He's in my all-time... Uh, world 11 as yeah. a left back. Yeah, yeah. I, put yeah, yeah. In, I put him in at left back, Ruffy. And right. I don't know if you noticed when, oh. he re when he retired there, he took up professional tennis uh, doubles with a, t a tennis pal of his, and he entered a big, big tournament in Did Italy. He? 
I didn't know that. See, that is why you're on the yeah. program, Ruffy. Just <laughs> little tidbits of stuff that um, we just don't know. Gordon no. and I have yeah. we've picked, we haven't picked yeah. up on that sort of thing because we don't yeah. read OK Hello and <laughs> Heat yeah. magazine. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, you probably appreciate this. He played in his first tournament and got beat six nil, six nil, six one. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's, he's good. that's his last he's tournament. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, yeah. I, I guarantee you, Ruffy, <laughs> I'm going to say this on air so that you can vouch for it, Gordon, but I don't think I'll, I'm going to go through the entire season and say that my goal is to take a set off him at tennis. I mean, right. I've got to take a set off him. I, I don't know if it's feasible for a guy who's been playing for 10 singles, years. Singles? Is this singles? Singles. Right. Yeah. Is, you know? Yeah. And remember, I'll be 66 by now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point, Ruffy. Um, OK, let's deal with uh, some of the other issues. Of course, the main headline has been Ian Cathro under pressure at Hearts. Uh, Christoph Berra, of course, the captains were all uh, speaking today. Christoph Berra says the next four games are make or break for Hearts. No surprise that uh, some of the... Uh, uh, prominent players, the more experienced yeah. players, are well aware of the pressure the manager's mm -hmm. under. I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, we're all talking about be him being a laptop coach. The biggest thing for me is the players buying into what he's saying to them. That, that For me, that is the... If they stop believing in what he's telling them and trying to go over in the dressing room, how they want to play, tactical decisions, forget the laptop stuff... It's what they believe he is doing and if he's doing it right. And it's when the players start doubting what's happening, that's when you've got problems. I don't think it's at that <coughs> stage just now. Obviously, you've got fans who are upset. That's another another side of it. But uh, for me, it's all about the players. And as long as the big players come out talking about, yeah, we're behind the manager, we believe what he's doing, it's up to us to get it right, I think he's OK. Yeah, one other significant point from some of the captains today was uh, <coughs> Celtic captain Scott Brown acknowledging that this season he expects a title challenge from Aberdeen and Rangers. Last season, he completely discounted them and he was proved to be correct, but this season he thinks, you know, there will be a challenge from Ibrox. There will be only if Celtic don't have the kind of season that they had last season, you know, invincibles as they were called, because <laughs> no one could beat them, no one takes points, and if they go through like that, but it's hard to do that two years in a row. I think it will be a bit tougher. Aberdeen have, have recruited quite well. Rangers are definitely uh, beginning to look as if they could be a much better side, even just in terms of friendlies. We can't tell exactly yet until the competitive games come along, but in that respect, I, I certainly do hope that Scott Brown's right. I want to see competitiveness. If Celtic are still the best team, great, they deserve to win it. But you want to see a competitive league. You want to see teams that are challenging each other for these competitions. So I think that, you know, hopefully we're going to get a better league this season. But Celtic were just too good for everybody last year. Uh, this week, I <coughs> think, will be a strong gauge of how possible uh, that is for Celtic to go through a season, you know, beating uh, everyone before them, uh, Ruffy. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, basically, if, if Celtic were to get into the group stages of the Champions League, that brings its own pressure. Um, European football in any capacity, even if it was the Europa League, brings its own pressure on the squad. Secondary to that as well, I actually think there are stronger teams this season mm -hmm. that will really <clears throat> um, test them over 90 minutes. I, you know, I, I've been raving about um, Hibs, I think, will be... Uh, you know, stronger. I think Aberdeen for me have been impressive. Rangers as well will gather momentum. You know, and some of the other sides. You, you know, what mm -hmm. will Neil McCann do at Dundee? Can Partick Thistle yeah. make sure they're a top six side this season again? Those sides are the ones that are, are making me mm -hmm. think it'll be mightily difficult. I don't see Celtic going through the entire season unbeaten no. this season, and that's not been dismissive of their qualities. No, I think the big part of last <laughs> year. The difference between Celtic and the rest where when Celtic weren't playing particularly well or on their game, they had the three best players. Mm -hmm. They had the three best players that could win any game for you, Dembele, Sinclair and Roberts. And, and that's why I think they had the big, big advantage over everybody. If you think back then, when things were not happening the way it should have, these were the three guys who stepped up with unbelievable magic, unbelievable goals. And that's why I think they were ahead of everybody else. Yeah, OK. Um, you can give us your thoughts at Peter and Ruffy on Twitter. 
facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy as well. We're getting uh, ever closer to the start of yet another new season 2017-2018. Who do you think is going to win the league and give us your thoughts on that and who will be relegated and who might be involved in a playoff? No point in asking Ruffy. He's tipped Hamilton Ackies for years hmm. now. He's just hoping that one year he's going to be right. We're sticking by, uh, they're staying in the league at times, but will we stick by it this season? Um, as far as else where the, the one thing that's uh, you know week after week making us look on with envious eyes is the money that's going on down south um, uh, it looks as if there's a few players going to be on the move Matic um, looks as if he's going to swap the blue of Chelsea for the red of Manchester United yeah and I think they're talking about 40 million for him too the price ranges are just getting out of order I mean it's incredible but you know, as Jose Mourinho was saying, I think you know he spend an ordinary player now is twenty million. Yeah. It? Do you think the bubble will burst, uh, Gordon? For, maybe not for the. Yeah. Uh, I don't see it bursting for the the, the actual um, league, but I see the bubble bursting for individual clubs who make mistakes in business because that's what football is down south. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that it's, everything's just going over the top with it, but it's it's just because the money's there. But I mean, as I say, as long as people are doing it in a sensible business fashion then you know you can't knock it too much but that's a big problem are they doing that are teams even though they're bringing in fortunes in terms of the, the income for the club sometimes the income doesn't even match up what they're actually putting out so that is a big danger but the, everyone's everyone's under pressure because all the teams even promoted teams are under pressure to bring players in and buy players so they can compete because everyone thinks that the only way you can get decent players and as soon as somebody's in the premiership as I know full well, my old team Brighton have just gone up and, and they've been in for one, trying to get one or two players and they've not quite gone to the sort of level they've been asked for, but people are wanting a lot of money from them because they know they're getting an income of about 180, 200 million right away and they want fortunes for the players they're interested in getting. Yeah, just uh, one story to finish which has caught my eye um, today, Robbie, which is safe standing. Now, um, Celtic's uh, corner, uh, where the, the safe standing is in Scotland, has been a huge success as far as a project. Questions over uh, some of the fans that are standing in it and their conduct, but uh, the safe standing area uh, developed <coughs> off the back of what was happening in Germany has proved a success. Interestingly enough, the uh, Shankly Supporters Union has voted um, you know, with a huge majority in favour of safe standing coming in at Anfield if mm. you know they get the go ahead uh, I think that's significant because clearly everybody was looking at the sensitivity surrounding Liverpool and their fans bearing in mind Hillsborough um, they've uh, given it the all clear Shrewsbury Town look as if they could become the first club in England who, who have an all-seater stand to give it the, the, the green light Yeah I think Liverpool is significant I think uh, all, all the people of our age the, the thing that stood out most at Liverpool was the cop Mm -hmm. uh, and visibly swaying back and forward at goals and action and, and it was an incredible sight to see so I, I think a team like Liverpool with that uh, stand there would be great to see I think it would add something and you touched on it there Borussia Dortmund just says it all for me yeah. and and I think the COP would be a similar effect the way they are with their supporters Yeah, I played there a few times at the COP <coughs> and, and uh, Anfield and the COP were amazing I mean it really did the, the atmosphere was tremendous. There's no doubt about it. And I think, I know the Hillsborough thing is a big factor in it because it is Liverpool Football Club that are going back to doing this, but safe standing is the key to it. And the word safe is, is a crucial factor here, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we uh, wish them well if indeed they bring in the safe standing. I know John Dark of the safe standing operation has been on this programme talking about uh, how the fans would enjoy that experience. It certainly creates a superb atmosphere. You can give us your thoughts on that. Uh, thanks to Gordon Smith for joining us on the programme tonight. Uh, we will continue our build-up this week towards the start of the new season in the Premiership in Scotland and across all other divisions. We'll have special guests, but from Gordon Smith, from Alan Ruff and from myself, Peter Martin, thanks for watching. Joining us at half seven tomorrow night, if you can.